Next in our artist top installment is Alice Walton. Um, Alice won the one of the French residencies um, in the BCB in 2019. So you were a recent graduate at the time, exhibited in French, and you won the Wedgwood residency. <laughs> and then if we also, so that's two years ago, can we believe it? <laughs> and then thinking about the time in between. So we had um, intended to host Alice here in Stoke-on-Trent for 10 weeks in exploring and creating entirely new work for the festival. And then as we know, things came up, the <laughs> pandemic happened and we had to really rethink so much. Um, and we did loads of Zoom calls where you got together with the other artists and the other hosts. So there's staff at your university, my colleagues at BCB, my colleague Joanne Mills took you all on a virtual tour of the Spodework site. And we were trying to fill in these Stoke context and, mm. and things with you guys, though you were at a distance. Um, and like also, if we think about it, that time was difficult for people in so many different ways and it wasn't always the most creative time for many and without access to museums and inspiration as we normally would have done. And since then, with the amazing help and support from our partners at Wedgwood and the DNA Wedgwood Collection at Barlaston, um, and you have just really persevered in creating an incredible body of work regardless of the circumstances and I think the exhibition downstairs is really a testament to your resilience and courage to continue to create regardless. Um, so it's really lovely to have you here Alice and to learn more about your work, the work that you've created um, from the residency. So thank, thank you, you. thank you. <laughs> um, yes it was a a really incredible honour to get the award and um, and I don't know, something that I could never imagine. Um, but during the times, I would say that this project was one of the most difficult things I've ever done because um, it took me on such a creative journey, but all from my studio in Somerset. So um, I'll try and talk you through it now. So next slide please. Um, so my name's Alice Walton and for anyone that doesn't know my work um, I'm known now for making large-scale uh, porcelain uh, ceramic sculptures. Very textural, um, often um, inspired by journey and place and so the idea of working with Wedgwood and traveling to Stoke and being so outside of where I'm normally used to working, it was such an ex exciting prospect for me really. And um, before starting the residency, I'd just started to explore the use of gradient, uh, gradients of color, um, layering these individual ribbons of porcelain over an internal form um, that's hollow to create this sort of meandering shape where your eye doesn't really know where to focus and um, wants to explore the, the form all the way around the object. Thank you. So just out of lockdown and like raring to go, um, I was really, really lucky to be able to visit for a fleeting day trip back in April. And um, the Wedgwood team was so wonderful with allowing me to go everywhere. It was really um, a frantic but incredibly inspiring day where I was given tours of each, uh, the different levels within the factory and the museum. And I just thought I'd, this um, photo really shows just when you're walking through the factory, if, if anyone um, is yet to go, I'd, I'd very much urge them to go. Um, and I was noticing all of these kind of stacked wares which were in different stages of production. And I was able to chat to the really warm and inviting makers. that uh, Some of them had been working there for years and years. Um, 
I was able to talk to them about um, process and their days and the holiday plans and they were just so so lovely and inviting so next slide please um, and one thing that um, I was really attracted to was all, all of these um, repetitive uh, objects which were being made were all stacked and left in place for the next person to pick up and it was this sort of rotation and um, incredible production line obviously that was so slick um, and so refined and also so daunting to go into as a, as a maker just working on my own and seeing how they've got this process really um, thought out. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the most exciting um, rooms, or, or should I say buildings, I think I've ever been into um, at um, the factory in Barliston was this amazing warehouse lined um, with rows, almost like a, a supermarket, but filled with just years and years of history of objects. All of these case moulds, um, the red ones made from silicon, the white plaster, just showing this um, kind of incredible snap, snapshot of um, the last hundred, hundreds of years. Like Exactly. Yeah, I could. I could have lived in there. I could have spent ten weeks in there. Um, and also, when I was going around, the the design team that I was I was working with, and they were showing me around. Um, they said, "Oh yes, help yourself. You can pick anything." And at, in, in each point of the tour, they said, "Oh yeah, you can use this, or you can do this." And I was. It was so overwhelming because I've never. I've, I've worked on residencies in the past where there's always been a restriction, whether there's a, a certain size of a kiln or certain facilities. And this was really anything I could do. And it was, yeah, it was very overwhelming. Um, but it was, it was also lovely to go around this warehouse because the design team that were showing me around were walking past and you can see some of the names up there of some of the vases that they'd worked on maybe maybe last week, but maybe months ago or years ago, and they were remembering back to these amazing projects that they'd done. Um, and I was talking to, um, I think it was the production manager, and he was saying, because I, I was talking about how organized this whole room was with the labeling and all of the parts of the mold in place. And they were saying, well, it, it looks that way, but for instance, the Portland vase, um, it's a mould that has m multiple parts and then the handles are another mould which is separate from it. And what often happens with these multiple part moulds is they are archived and put, put in their place on the shelf. And then maybe another project or a new project will come up where they're told, oh, let's, let's go get that mould or let's go get that master from this vase that we made 20 years ago and someone will go and get it and bring it back. They'll work on it or develop that further and then go and put it back in the storeroom but maybe it's put back by someone different. And so the placement gets moved around and that object gets displaced and it's n no longer complete anymore. And I thought that that's really incredible that there is so much history in this building, but it's all sort of jigsawed and all in different places. And no one is going to be able to reorganize that ever because no one has been there for all of those projects because too much time has passed. And I thought the idea of taking parts of certain objects and creating a new object could be something that I could bring forward into this project. So next slide, please. So going back to anything is possible, um, going into um, an area that I could only just uh, resemble with um, the cheese counter in Sainsbury's where you go along and they say, oh, would you like a bit of iconic Saxon blue? And they just snip a bit off for you. And um, I went along and chose my colours of 
this palette of beautiful jasper clay, which is a, a coloured, very fine, beautiful clay to work with. Next slide, please. And they delivered it home to me. So a lovely range of all of these colours that I could start working with. Next slide. So I started by, um, very slowly I think, started by just testing out the colours on their own. So making these little test tiles that I would fire and I could use as reference for my sculptures. Um, next slide please. And then I wanted to pursue the idea and um, and really make a feature that you can take these very iconic colours but there are so many colours within them if you blend them together. So this is a pre-fired test working on a sheet of white clay, the white jasper, and then blending between the Saxon blue and the OB23, which is a, is a white. And all of these lovely tones that you can get in the middle, I think are really special. Next slide, thank you. So with lots of testing going on in my studio, working on my own and thinking, ah, what am I going to do? I knew I had to go back for um, an intensive time. This time, um, a week I spent, Monday to Friday um, in June earlier this year. And my first stop was go to go to the incredible uh, V&A Wedgwood collection. And I'd seen photos online that people had visited in the past and um, looked at these incredible books. But like, I, I, again, I could have stayed in there for another 10 weeks. Like this, the size of the books um, just viewed on these giant pillows were incredible. And um, looking through the notes that um, Wedgwood had written about certain tests and the depth of testing has really been inspiring. And I, I think it, I'll always think of that time. Um, but also looking at the, the hand-coloured drawings in the shape books, sort of archiving and showing a, a full catalogue of all these different shapes was, was really amazing. Next slide. How many people have looked at them as well? Well, I think, I think the, yeah, I know, it was incredible. I felt very privileged. I think the design team do take a lot of um, inspiration still. Um, I think some of their new designs um, are actually re referencing some of the old Wedgwood patterns, which I think is lovely, like revisiting the those themes. Well. Really, really wonderful. Um, and um, I also loved looking at how they um, would plan for um, plan for de for designs and how pattern would work across 3D forms, but how like we know this is a, a teapot lid, but how it was only necessary to um, capture a certain point of it, so just over the halfway point of this, um, and showing different gradients of how it would be decorated over this form. Next. Um, and again, I was, I, I was really drawn to how these objects were just shown in part and really cut um, to just take a little aspect through. I really liked the, the severe nature of the kind of the cut line down the centre and your eye can imagine what is meant to be. Next slide. So again, looking at these beautiful hand-painted, repetitive pattern um, that's going to feature a rounder form, mapping out that surface. Next slide, please. And one of the, um, my favorite cabinets at the v and Wedgwood collection was um, a cabinet that's filled with um, traveling salesman teapots. So traveling salesmen would go around with a suitcase and to be able to show as many wares as possible, it was more efficient for them to just carry around half teapots to give the, the customer the idea of what the teapot would be like, but would be able to show the full range. And again, cutting through the object um, lets you imagine what, what you can buy or, or what, you can, what you can have. 
And um, actually, this is something that I discovered, which I, I haven't had a chance to kind of show with this project, but it's something that I'm definitely going to take further. Like now the, um, now the kind of the show is um, complete here. This, um, this effect on the Jasper ware, it's called uh, smear glaze. Um, and I, I was told by uh, one, of the, one of the curators at the V&A, Rebecca, that, because um, I'd never heard of a smear glaze before, but it's where an object isn't glazed, but once, when it's fired through its glaze firing, it's put into an ap atmosphere which is surrounded by a lot of glazed ware, and the glaze almost um, blushes the coating of the unfired and gives this sort of um, like just a touch of glaze where it's there's sort of a sheen on the surface, but it's there isn't there isn't being glaze applied. And I, I really want to take that further with my work because I don't glaze my um, porcelain in my own practice. And I think this is quite a nice way to have like a blush or like a, um, a, f a flash of glaze over a surface. So that's something I want to take, take forward. Next slide, please. So um, <coughs> back in the, in the Wedgwood factory, um, I was given a studio area for the week to work in. And I knew that I wanted to pack in as much as possible. And with time being at the essence, and so many things that were available to me, I knew I needed to reduce and almost restrict what was possible. So I definitely want to, wanted to explore color and surface and blending, but one thing that I thought I could restrict were, uh, would be the form. So. I requested that um, in the couple of weeks before my visit, any pieces that they slip cast, um, that they had excess, would they be able to put one or two pieces from each batch into a wet cabinet for me? So I had pieces when I turned up in June that were cast, that were very traditional forms, they're waiting for me, or very modern, uh, modern forms, so folia vases or um, trying to think of some other names now on the spot, I can't, but a, a really amazing range of wet clay objects, new and old. And um, the slip caster that was there all week with me um, was an amazing, talented man called Bunny. And um, on the base, of all of the, the, the pieces that were cast on the day. They're all back stamped with um, the Wedgwood stamp. And whenever each person that touches a piece of work in Wedgwood, whenever they uh, do work on it, they'll, they'll write a little signature or their initials. And on the back of mine, it's, uh, on quite a lot of mine, it says JB, which is uh, Bunny's initials. And I wanted to keep that there to kind of reference him as the caster for the pieces. Next slide, please. So um, this was a piece that we saw in the uh, I saw in the V and A Wedgwood collection, a, collection um, a traditional vase. And when I was there, I was lucky that they were casting up a few, and they said that I could have one. So I took it back into the studio and started cutting it up, um, which was a bit, a bit of a, a strange, brutal <laughs> thing for them to see when they've been casting these beautiful objects, but I had plans for them, so I did it with confidence. Um, next slide, please. So I spent a few days um, working quite intuitively with the cast objects that I had, cut them up, saw how they tessellated together, tried inverting them, turning them upside down, tried combining them, some forms were working with me, some weren't so much. And also practically, they had to be balanced and, and look visually right in my eyes. Next slide. 
So I started the decorating process. So you can see the way I work. I've taken two objects here. So it's a magnolia vase on the lower half and uh, one of their bud vases, which I've um, connected up. And then I score uh, the surface and add water and then create ribbons of colored jasper and start assembling over it. So I'm working over the form and um, allowing it to kind of snake around the piece to invite you to look around. Next slide. Do you work quite intuitive things and have you applied a ribbon length or do you have an idea of where you want it to start, where you want it to finish? So um, I, I tend to work in two halves. So I think I start by building the form um, with an idea of what colour I want to use. Um, generally at home I pre-mix all my colours after I've built the object. Um, and then I, I spend quite a lot of time kind of stepping back and looking at it and seeing how I can imagine this kind of maybe a sweeping or whether I start and you'll see in a later piece some patterns coming over it. Um, and I think some, for me, some um, forms work better with a certain sort of pattern or movement um, or sort of flow over the form. So I think quite intuitively, really. Yeah, yeah. So um, after the week, I thought, so how am I going to get all this work back to Somerset because I, I um, didn't drive there um, <laughs> um, and again Wedgwood being Wedgwood they were completely accommodating and said don't worry package it all up we'll get it down to you and they they sent everything down so I all all wet on damp plaster bats with a bag over all their recycled packaging around the edge and they got it down to me, safe and sound. And they all said, it's not going to survive. <laughs> and I kept saying, you've slip cast it very well. <laughs> um, like it's, it's amazing clay. It's um, incredible, incredible to work with. Next slide, please. So back in my studio um, and I continued decorating. Um, for me, the building process is quite quick. And particularly if um, a lot of the pieces are slip cast, um, but the decorating takes hours and hours. And um, I knew that that was going to be something that I would then work on for the next few months. Um, I'd learned with Wedgwood a better way to preserve the works and to keep them at that damp stage, even going through a warm summer, a warm few months that we had. And it's always been a battle for me in my work, if I'm working on a large scale, to keep it wet because the process of decorating takes so long. So with this piece, um, one of the, the folia vase was the um, undershape. Um, I decided to try something new and to work with that pattern to mimic in the ribbon. So next slide, please. Um, so this was a fully decorated and you can see it downstairs. Um, so before I've cleaned up the edge, which is something I did at a later stage. And you can see how the pattern um, mimics the, the pattern of the, the original vessel. And I think that was important to me to um, keep a reference of, of the, the jasper and the, the origins of where they've come from. Next slide, please. Um, so also, um, as well as having work here, I also have sh um, a small show, or uh, an amazing showcase. It's not small, it's a really big cabinet um, at the V&A Wedgwood Collection. And there I've also been able to show some of my cameo trials, which are uh, lots of different um, pieces which show all of the different blends that I've been producing. And I just thought I'd show this to, um, to repeat what I said earlier about how I've been working with these classic um, 
well-known Wedgwood colours, but the middle tones, I think there's so much more exploration that I can, I can look at there as well. Next slide, please. So um, as well as blending from one colour to another, I wanted to take it further and blend from one to another to another. So a triaxial blend, so blending three together. Um, and instead of working on a flat tile for a test, next slide please, um, I wanted to um, work over a 3D form, uh, which was quite challenging when the clay at its wet stage looks very similar to one another. So that's the Portland Pass. <laughs> so I had to decorate a Portland Pass, didn't I? <laughs> yeah. Um, so working out how I can map out and have some sort of um, system in place. So putting pins in with numbers and knowing exactly what colour each number was. Next slide, please. And one thing that um, it hadn't dawned on me was working with um, a vessel forms it would bring a new challenge. So all of my sculptures in the past are enclosed forms. So a form without an edge or a rim. So now having that as a challenge, I would have to know what to do with that ribboning line that's coating it. So whether that ribboning line goes around the outside, over the top and into, into the um, interior of, of the shape. Next slide. Or whether that line or ribbon comes up and stops abruptly. So this is one of the pieces um, I've got on show downstairs. So when that was finished, I then uh, sanded um, that top edge with a diamond, diamond sandpaper. So it gives that really crisp cut and that reference back to Wedgwood with the Saxon blue interior. Next slide, please. Or whether um, that um, the ribboning pattern goes around the outside and just tucks in. Next slide, please. And so this is the Portland vase with the triaxial blend, so the pink, the Saxon and the sage blending up and over the form. Next slide, please. And this is the travelling Port Portland with a slice through it, so half of it is um, the Portland vase and half being um, one of the uh, contemporary vases that is still for sale in um, the world of Wedgwood. Next slide, please. And this is the finished piece that you saw in the process shots a moment ago. Next slide. And then one thing I haven't tried out before is working on a more um, extreme pattern um, which I, I'm still not too sure how I feel about this piece, but I like, <coughs> again, that, um, that edge around the top of the traditional vessel. Next slide, please. And um, this is the incredible um, display that I've got at the um, Vino Wedgwood collection. Thank you. So I just wanted to say like an incredible thank you to um, the British Ceramics Biennale, um, the Wedgwood design team, the Wedgwood factory, the Wedgwood, uh, the V&A Wedgwood collection, Fisker's group, and uh, my gallery, Ting Ying Gallery. So thank you. <laughs>
making um, a new body of work for, again, um, inspired by place. Um, so um, it's for Make in Hauser and Wirth in Somerset, so um, inspired by the beautiful garden that's there. So that will be in November. So I'm working my socks off for, for that deadline, yeah. <laughs> Um, so my my mum's a textile artist, so she's always been I've been so lucky to be fully supported and and said yes, it's fine to do an art career. <laughs> like, um, uh, with, so, no, you've got to be a solicitor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> probably yeah. Um, and um, instead, I don't know. You know, when you make these decisions in your life that you can't remember why you made them and. I decided not to go to my local college um, to do a foundation in art and design. I went to Wimbledon School of Art um, to do it. And um, that was really lucky because my local college didn't have a ceramics department, but Wimbledon did. Um, so thank goodness for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lovely medium to work in. Wonderful, oh, yeah, I love it. Yeah. So rewarding. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank I'm you. Give us a bit of a story. Thank you. Thank you.